Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Thursday morning here in Texas and uh, just a good morning to be spending time with Jesus, loving on Jesus, growing to know Jesus, growing to know his love for us and growing to love him and obey him more and more and more and more. It's, uh, I mean, I say it over and over and over and over again, but as much as I say it, I need to remind myself of it. Uh, you know, I can say it here in the studio while I'm doing the teachings. I say it all the time, but yet, you know, uh, still to, to, to live my life throughout each day, pursuing Jesus is, you know, it's, it's a challenge. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Well, we're moving into Romans chapter 10 today. Uh, chapter nine was, uh, again, it's just this whole book. It's just overwhelming. Chapter nine, we dealt, uh, we dealt with the topic of, of election um, and predestination and God's choosing. And the chapter was, was very, you know, was very heavily weighted in, in all that God has done and in, in making his choice. Now, when we move over into chapter 10 and really the last few verses of chapter nine, Paul's going to switch over to, to the fact that there is human responsibility, that we do have a responsibility uh, to, to exercise our free will in acknowledging our sin and receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, trusting and relying in him alone as opposed to in our own efforts or our own goodness or our, in our own righteous life. Um, so chapter 10 is again now going to turn, it's going to turn to the other side of the coin. So you almost see two sides, you know, it's, uh, you know, God's election and, and then, and then our responsibility in receiving Christ, it, it's almost like two sides of the same coin. Now, again, depending if you have a systematic or a framework like Calvinism or Arminianism or, uh, or provisionism, um, or any of the others, then you, 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 you tend to wait in one side, uh, you know, people who maintain a reformed view or a Calvinist view, um, they, they wait entirely in the sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation. They don't see it as two sides of the same coin. They don't see it as the two work together. Certainly all of us are objects of mercy and objects of grace. Uh, as we said in the, in the, in the previous chapter, the question is, has our heavenly father extended his grace, his common grace for salvation to all people? Has every person received the common grace of God? Has every human in the world been given the grace of God that they do have the capacity to receive Jesus Christ? Or, you know, has God chosen his particulars or his favorites, um, those he wanted to be saved? Has he plucked those out? and let all the rest go their own way uh, to eternal hell, that we were all going, save his mercy and grace. Um, and so we discussed that in the last chapter. Now, chapter 10 is just, again, it's just, it's Romans. So it's the whole Bible, but it's just, it's incredible. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness, your grace, your wonder, your love, Father. We thank you that we have our Bible. We thank you that we have these scriptures, Father. We thank you that we have the living word of God to guide us and train us and transform us. But above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life on our behalf that we could never live. We thank you for dying a torturous death that we should have died. And we thank you that you are alive and risen. And we worship you today, our risen Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. We ask you to give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, I'm not sure how many, uh, this will either be two or three teachings. I'd like to get it done in two. It may stretch to three. We'll see. All right, Romans 10, chapter 1. I'm sorry, Romans 10, verse 1. Brothers. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. 
For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. Verse 6, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth And in your heart, that is the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So that's verses one to 11. You know, we'll see how far we get. So again, if you turn back to chapter nine and you look, you know, Paul was, was, was forcefully, um, you know, laying down the fact that God will have mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. He'll have compassion on whom he wants to have compassion. It isn't dependent on our effort, but on God's mercy. Um, But he never told us the reasoning behind that. He certainly made it clear that God will choose whom he wants to choose for salvation. But he didn't give us the reasons for that. Okay, he didn't give us the basis for that. Was there any basis? Was there a basis in us? Was it that God foreknowing who, when presented with the gospel, would believe it, receive it? And, did, you know, obviously he does know that. And did he know before we were born who would reject it? Obviously he does know that. And was that the basis for his election and for his choosing and for who he would show mercy? Now, when we moved into verse 30 in chapter 9, you know, Paul begins to explain the reasoning for this. In verse 30 of chapter 9, he says, what then shall we say? You know, what's the response to all this, to the forceful things he's just said? And he says that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as, that, but as if it were by works. Um, and so now, you know, he's going to go on and then he'll move into chapter 10. And he says in brother, now remember, there were no chapters. Paul didn't put chapters. This was a letter written to Romans and scholars have chaptered and versed it out, right, 500 years ago. Paul says, brothers, my heart's desire, verse 1, Romans 10, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Let that, let that verse sink in, Nathan. All right? Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. If you turn back to chapter 9 and you look at... Uh, Uh, Verse 2, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. So in chapter 9, he spoke about how, how deeply he desires all Israel, all the country of Israel, the chosen people of God. He's earnestly desiring their salvation And if he could, he knows he can't, but if he could, he would wish that if it would be okay for him to be cut off, if he could be a substitute. Now, he can't. None of us can be. Only Jesus can be that substitute. But Paul makes an incredible declaration that that certainly I cannot recognize in my own heart, that, that we can sometimes recognize in our children and things like that. But Paul said that he could wish in chapter 9 that if he was cut off from Christ and doomed for eternity in hell, that he would accept that or he could wish for that if it meant that all the people of Israel, the whole nation of Israel, would receive Christ. And he had tremendous grief and anguish over their rejection. And they're, you know, consequently, they're going to hell for eternity. It really bothered him. 
And obviously it ought to bother us, those people that are not saved. But look at uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So now again, he's, he's, he's referencing the fact that he has this earnest desire that they receive salvation. And he's going to put the onus and the responsibility entirely on them. He's not going to blame God. He's not going to blame the fact that they they weren't elect. Um, He's not going to blame the fact that they weren't chosen. And so he's going to put the responsibility firmly on them. Um, And again, from certain views of election, uh, this is a contradiction on its face. Now, again, those who hold to a reform view will defend that it's not a contradiction. And again, they can you know, uh, they can spin a masterful weave. And again, they may be correct. Um, But Paul says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He doesn't only desire may for them to be saved, but he's praying that they may be saved. How often do you, how often are you praying for those in your circle, those you know, those you've heard of, that you know are not saved, that they would be saved. It's it's not enough just to desire things, but how much are we praying for the things we desire to do? Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Mm, good coffee. So again, we we ought to have a lifestyle when you when you desire the things of Christ for others. Obviously, salvation being the most important, but not only that, anything else, right, Alicia? There ought to be prayer that accompanies it. So again, examine your life. And if you would say, yeah, no, I desire a lot of things for folks, but I'm not praying enough for them. Let's begin to do that today. Just saying that, I I, I believe I need to be praying more and interceding more. I have a lifestyle of intercession or praying for others, right, Kristen? But let's do that more. Let's be like our spiritual father Paul here. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Verse two, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. This is an extremely important verse. Again, Paul said, I'll testify. He himself was immensely zealous for God but he was persecuting Christians. He was having them put to death before Jesus appears to him. And you can read that account in the book of Acts, Scott, chapter 9, where they where, uh, where Saul is met by Jesus. Jesus appears to him um, on the road to Damascus where he's going to persecute Christians. And, uh, and Jesus reveals himself to him, knocks him off his horse, blinds him, and he, you know, He receives Christ, and he goes on to be the greatest Christian that ever lived, who who wrote half the New Testament. But before Paul, again, Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament, Scott, um, 13 of the 27. Before he became Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, and, and he was a tremendous persecutor of Christians. He had immense zeal for the traditions of the Jewish people, for the law, for the commandments. Um, But he did not recognize or receive Jesus as Messiah. He rejected him. So Paul says, I can testify about them that that the Jewish people, he, he still knows his Jewish brothers and sisters, those that are the teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, that they are extremely zealous for God. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. It is possible for us to have a a desire for God, a zeal for God. Every other religion in the world has people in it. There are extremely zealous and yes, pious Muslims, zealous and pious Buddhists, zealous and pious Hindus, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Why? Verse three, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. 
Verse 4, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Wow. All right. So what does this mean? All right. So if, if you're pursuing God today and you're zealous for God, but you're still trying to approach God in any level, it can't be, you know, a, a, a Buddhist or a Muslim or, or, or a Hindu. They are, they're trying to approach God in their own good life. They're trying to live as good a life as possible, which is, of course we should all do. But then they're hoping that when they stand before God, that that good life will somehow get them to heaven. Their trust and reliance is not in Christ. They haven't come to the end of themselves. They haven't seen and humbled themselves and said, I am a hopeless, helpless, desperate sinner that deserves only hell and nothing I can do can save me. Nothing I can do can help save me. Save me, Lord Jesus. They haven't thrown themselves at the foot of the cross and cried out to Jesus and called out to him to save them, knowing their, their desperate need of him. Their zeal for God is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness from, that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Again, if you're pursuing God today, in any manner as if your own good, righteous life is either going to get you to heaven or help you get to heaven. You're not submitting to God's righteousness. You're trying to establish your own righteousness, your own right standing with God. Do you see that? Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. The righteousness that comes from God is faith in Christ. Verse 4. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness. How? For everyone who believes, Corinth. Look at verse 4, Romans 10. Christ is the end of the law. What does that mean, the end of the law? Christ is the end. Christ completed the law. Christ fulfilled the law. When the Messiah came, when the Savior came, okay, it, it, it ends any, any way of trying to approach God by obeying the Ten Commandments, by doing good works. We should do all of these things, but we cannot approach our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul and going to heaven by doing good works. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be salvation, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes, not righteousness based on our own good life, based on our own good efforts, but, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to us when we believe in him and trust in him and rely on him and cling to him alone for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul. So again, ask yourself, do an examination. Are you resting today in your own good life? Are you hoping that God is going to let you into heaven based on anything to do with yourself or, or anything that's not Christ alone? Some people just want to have mercy, but they haven't received the mercy in Jesus Christ. Jesus, as we say every time, became a human man for every for all humanity, all 8 billion people living in the world now and all who have ever lived need Christ. Christ is the end of the law. How could he be the end of the law? Because he fulfilled the law, okay? Every single one of us has broken God's commands, has broken his law. We all have failed. None of us can fulfill the law. When we look into the Bible, the purpose of the law was never to save us. We were supposed to look at the commandments of God and the law of God and everything and say, I, I can't do this. I'm a hopeless, helpless, desperate sinner. What am I to do? And the scripture promised the Messiah, a savior would come and we were to put our hope and faith and trust in the savior. You, you turn over to the New Testament, the savior has come in Jesus Christ and he is the end of the law. Christ is the end of the law. Jesus is the only person, the God-man, that actually obeyed the law of God perfectly. 
flawlessly in thought, word, and deed, Lauren. Okay? So he's, he's the end of the law because he fulfilled the law. It doesn't mean the law has gone the way, but he's the end of us dealing with God based on law in any manner or in any way. The only purpose of the law is to show us our sin and to, and to drive us to faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to drive us to our need of a savior. Right, Uncle Dennis? Wow. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. We're made righteous when we receive and believe in Jesus Christ as our only Lord and Savior. When we put our full trust and confidence and hope in him alone, that perfect righteous life that Jesus did live in obeying the law is actually credited to us. Think about that. The perfect righteous obedience of Jesus is credited to you as if you lived it. So when God the Father looks at you, he sees that you perfectly obeyed the law in thought, word, and deed. You actually have the righteousness of Christ. You actually fully obeyed every aspect of the law in Christ. Christ has credited it to you. Your heavenly Father has taken that perfect righteous life of Christ and imputed it or credit it to you as if you lived it, and then taken all of your sin and my sin, past, present, and future, and credited it to Jesus Christ at the cross. That incredible exchange, David, is the heart of the Christian gospel. Wow, golly. So again, if you're trying to establish your own righteousness now, even a little bit. Some people say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I also have to live a good life. Okay. We do want to live a good life, but it has nothing to do with getting us to heaven or helping us get to heaven. Not a bit. Okay. Any, any of my good life would only ruin it. I, I do want to live a good life in Jesus. I want to live an obedient life, but it, it's in response to all that he's done for me. It's because I love him and I, and I want to obey him but it has nothing to do with my salvation. Look at verse five. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. What does that mean? So Moses, if you, if you, you know, it's in Leviticus 18.5, says that there is a way to be made right with God by following the law. And that way is that you have to do it perfectly. You would have to live your entire life beginning to end perfectly in thought, word, and deed. Obviously, it's impossible. No one can do it, right? Um, but he says, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. You could get life by the law. You could have eternal life by the law if you could do it perfectly in every manner, in every way, all the days of your life as Jesus did. Can you do that? Can I do that? Obviously not. So we cannot be made right with God by the law because we can't obey it perfectly. That would be the only way to be made right by the law. And as I said, only Christ did that. And when you trust in him and receive him as your savior, that, that perfect righteous obedience is credited to you as if you did it and your sin credited to him. It's incredible, right? Verse six, but the righteousness that, but the righteousness that is by faith says, okay? So there's a righteousness where you're trying to be made right in your own efforts by obeying the law. Verse six, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does this mean? Okay, so first he says, but the, righteous, the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. And this is part of Deuteronomy 30, uh, 30, 12, or who will descend into the deep. And that's 30, 13. What does he mean? So two things. Okay, number one, um, you know, the Savior has come. Christ has come. So, you know, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Okay. Um, 
that is to bring Christ down. The Savior has come, so you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't demand like you need to go to heaven to see Christ before you're going to believe, or Christ needs to come down here and show Himself for you. He has come. Okay, Jesus has come. He's given His life, and you don't need any more evidences than you already have. But also, you you can't work your way. Okay, you can't work your way all the way up to the sky. You can't establish your own righteousness. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. The right, it's by faith that you're made right with God. Don't say in your heart that I'm going to ascend into heaven by my own efforts, by my own righteousness. I'm going to climb this ladder to heaven. Do you see that? It's, it's a difficult passage, right? But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So you're not in your own efforts, right? Going to climb the ladder to heaven or go or, or go down to, to, to hell. It's it's not about you. It's, it's, it's by faith, right? Jesus has come. The Savior has come. So don't have all these demands in your heart that, you know, to bring Christ up, to bring Christ down. Look at verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. You have it. Verse 8, but the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. And there Paul is, uh, is, is quoting Deuteronomy 30.14. You notice Paul is consistently quoting the Old Testament scriptures here. Why does he keep quoting the scriptures, Rap? He's quoting them because it's the word of God, right, Pop? He's quoting the scriptures because it's the living word of God. It's the authority. Paul expects when his readers read the scriptures that they accept it as the authority and they believe it. That's not only what we ought to be doing as far as believing the scriptures when we read them, but we ought to be using the scriptures as an authority, believing that, that everyone else will believe it. Now, regrettably, many people, most people in the world don't see the scriptures are, as the authority, but they are the absolute authority. Okay, The Bible is the end of all things. Okay, The scriptures are our authority, Nathan, from beginning to end. Right. But what does it say? Okay, so you don't say in your heart you're going to ascend to heaven, you're going to go down into the deep. Again, it's not about you. It's about faith. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. Verse 8. That word of faith, again, is your faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ. Not in your own efforts. Not in your own righteousness. Right? Right? But what does it say? The word is near you. This gospel, this is why the gospel is being preached all over the world. This is why we send missionaries all over the world. This is why we do these teachings. This is why we have gospel tracts, because the word is near you. You don't need it for Christ to come up from the deep or Christ to come down from heaven. It's near you. The good news that a savior has come, that Jesus has come and he lived that perfect righteous life, died a torturous death and has been raised from the dead. And if you'll but receive him, you'll be saved. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. We are proclaiming the famous verse in verse nine, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you have a lifestyle of confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? One of the ways to know that you're saved is that you do have a lifestyle of confessing Jesus as Lord. You're not afraid to bring up Jesus as Lord, right? Again, it's not our words that save us, but it's, it's when we know our desperate need of a savior that we can run to Christ and throw ourselves at the foot of the cross and confess Jesus as our only Lord and savior, thereby showing that we believe that God raised him from the dead. Again, because we're not confessing a dead Jesus, right? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord? Do you believe in your heart 
not just the intellectual belief. Do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? And is there evidence of that by you confessing him as Lord? Wow. All right, we'll stop there and we'll, we'll pick up next time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness, your grace on our lives, Father. Father, we proclaim today, Lord, that our trust and reliance is not in ourselves or in our own goodness or in our efforts to, to keep the law or to obey. Our hope and reliance is in Jesus alone. We worship you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this message to our hearts now. Give us eyes that see Jesus, ears to hear him, and hearts to understand him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.